It's done. It's finally done. This is my investigational report on Angel Island Immigration Station. I was just there spending a whole day. Last year, Angel Island was erected. And soon after that, there has been complaints and news within the Chinese community that the Chinese immigrants there are being treated unfairly and unjustly. So the Chinese Chamber of Commerce and Chinese six companies petitioned to President William Howard Taft for a change. And as a result, the US Chamber of Commerce and the San Francisco Downtown Association formed a investigation committee. And I was fortunate enough to be invited to go alongside with them. In charge of our investigation at Angel Island is Acting Commissioner Luther Stewart. Quite a man, if you ask me. He was sweating profusely the whole time. He was so nervous when they saw us. Um, when I went into the island, the first thing we saw were the living quarters. The stench. I could never forget that stench. You know what it smells like? Death, desperation, hopelessness, and a morgue. It's crammed, it's dark, it's filthy. The windows are all wired in and covered. You can barely see any lights throughout the day. The acting commissioner steward informed us that the prisoners are free to go out whenever they want, whenever they like. They can get a breath of fresh air of San Francisco within the island. But after interviewing and talking to quite a lot of detainees, the truth turned out to be very different. They were only allowed to be outside the building once or twice a week for an hour. That is worse than how we treat our prisoners here in this country. Unacceptable. The fire escape doors are jammed. So one can only imagine what would happen if there were to be a fire. Total fatalities. It breaks my heart. My fellow brothers and sisters just like you and me, being treated that way. It truly breaks my heart. One of the detainees there, his name is Tom Lung. He's been there for four months. And he is a US born citizen. He was coming back from China after a long trip. And he was there because he could not recall what story of the building he lived on when he lived in San Francisco years ago. Just because of that, he wasn't even an immigrant. And he's been treated like, like an animal. One of my Chinese business partners, he brought his son over, young boy, 10, 11. And he went through a two hour long interrogation. And after the interrogation, my friend, my partner, went through a similar process just to reconfirm that everything that poor boy stated were true. They were asking him questions like, you're not gonna believe this. Every single person's name in his village What story of the building that he lived on, just like Tom Long. And being provoked, my friend confronted the officer and said, do you know how many, building, how many windows the building you live in have? Of course he doesn't. 
The immigration station has been enforcing the Exclusion Act, the Chinese Exclusion Act, to an extent that it has become an extermination. Yes, extermination for Chinese immigrants, my people. Seeing that boy reminds me when I was 14. I came here to this magnificent country. I was on this filthy ship for months. I saw nothing but Pacific Ocean for God knows how many day and nights. I was looking forward to everything here. The people, even the air, the smell of the air, everything. And back then, there weren't as many, there was very little immigration enforcement. This, is, this, this was a free country, per se. Um, and I landed in the Bay of San Francisco. Nobody questioned me. I just walked in, and just like that. I went to high school, went to school in San Jose, the Bay Area, in Northern California. And almost nobody knew me by my name. I was called Chink, Rat Eaters, Barbarian, by everyone I knew. Hey, Chink, what are you doing there? Go dig me a railroad. Why won't you? People saw me and my country as weak, inferior. If I could tell them now, I would tell them that the China of yesterday is not the China of today. Must we cling on to our preconception, preconceived notion that China being immovable? Out of 45 centuries of history, I believe will arise a new nation out of the fog of conservatism and clouds of misunderstanding. I believe that China will become one of the most progressive and mightiest nations in this world. For there is nothing wrong with her except that she is out of step with her environment and out of step with the 20th century. I became a Christian in 1882. That was, that was my refuge. I felt safe. I felt that I could believe in something. And that's what our great nation's about. One nation under God. But ironically, in 1882, that was when the US Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which barred all Chinese laborers from entering this country. An exempt class like myself, merchants, are never allowed to become a naturalized US citizen. They call us immigrants eligible for citizenship. I graduated from the San Francisco Theolog Theological Seminary in 1892, and I became a system pastor at the Chinese Presbyterian Church. And that was my, when, I, when my mission started. In 1894, I moved down to Los Angeles and became a main pastor of the first Chinese Presbyterian Church there. And that was when I started my first newspaper as well, first weekly called the Chinese American Weekly. Back then, I used my paper mainly for, um, for preaching, to be quite honest. Um, almost every single one of us, all 3,000 of us Chinese immigrants, Chinese people in Los Angeles was, was reading that paper. Um, we talked about our belief in Christ, our belief for this country, freedom, equality, even though we don't get much. Um, 
And in 1900, a few really influential and wealthy merchants in San Francisco invited me and funded me to go back up north in San Francisco to start a daily newspaper. And that's when my life's work began. It's called Chonsan Yapo, the daily newspaper of the China and the West. It is a six-page newspaper daily. We place the newspaper at $6 a year. Um, our competitors, six other newspaper, granted they were weeklies, they were $5 a year. But I consider that pretty good pricing since we offer six times as much news. We talked about domestic politics here in the United States, especially related to our Chinese community. We follow the Chinese Exclusion Act very closely. We talk about what's been going on in China, the revolution, the people looking for a better future, for a change. We cover women's rights. We compare women's treatment in China to the US. And you'd be surprised how much parallel there are. And in 1906, when the great earthquake happened in San Francisco, my paper, our paper, raised a lot of money for people and families that lost their loved ones in their homes. And within six months our newspaper started, we reached 3,500 subscribers. And now it's all across the world. In Mexico, in Canada, in the Philippines, even Panama, and even back in China. It's, it's one of the, it is the only Chinese daily newspaper outside of China. I'm extremely proud of that. And even with all this progress that we've been making within our community, for our people, people still perceive us badly, even to this day. It's, it's horrendous. If I had a choice of my complexion, what it picks, I don't know. Blue, purple, pink. But I didn't have a choice. Therefore, I'm yellow. But I believe that the complexion of a man doesn't define him. It has been found out that after all, all our blood is red. And we all have the image of the common father. And because of that, I started lecturing around the country, west, east, midwest, even in the south. Start going to YMCA's, lecture halls, to talk about what I know of China, my culture, my people, the customs, our beliefs, the food, everything. Because I want people to see us for who we are, you know. Not how we look or our skin color. Um, and it was very well received. People around the country called me the Chinese Mark Twain, um, the father of Chinese journalism in the United States. And the list go on. They call me a humorist. They thought I was one of the best lecturers that they've ever seen. But ironically, even though they compare me to that many greats in this country, I still cannot become a US citizen. And we fought hard for that every day. No progress. And I've encouraged my people within my community to, to appreciate and adapt, assimilate 
to the US culture. I encourage them to cut off their cues, you know, the long ponytails, and um, to dress in Western clothing. Because I know that by doing so, by, by putting on a Western image, people will see us more clearly, not just another Chinaman, not just another laundry shop owner. You know, I, I, I love this country. I, I, I love this country greatly. I, I owe everything to, to the United States of America. I, I love it greatly from the bottom of my heart. It is my second home. It is my home. I just wish that could be the case for all my fellow brothers and sisters that came here that are being detained in that island, in that prison, in that dungeon. I was, I have the freedom. I'm married to my wife, Chun Fa, in 1892, and we have four wonderful, brilliant daughters, Manani, Rose, Caroline, and Effie, and one brilliant son, Edward. Um, we had our wedding in both Chinese and Western traditions. It was even reported in the San Francisco Chronicles. Um, all of us here are immigrants. This is a nation of immigrants, after all. Our parents, our grandparents, all came from a different country for a better future, for ourselves, for their children. There's no difference. The Chinese are no difference. We work hard, we're humble, we're kind. We just want a better future like everyone else. We're not stealing anyone's jobs. We're one of the smallest immigrant groups in China, in, in, in the United States. We're just not stealing anyone's jobs. And that's why this This Exclusion Act has to go. It has to. And the condition in Angel Island has to be changed completely. And that's why I'm writing this report. This report will be on my newspaper today. Front page. Right in the center. So all my fellow brothers and sisters within my community will see it. And we'll come together. And we'll fight back. Just like we've been doing. We will not give up. Strength in numbers. I truly believe in that. There's a proverb in Chinese. If you will, you can. I believe in that all my life, even before I came here. If I will, I can. If we will, we can. This will happen. Sooner or later, this will happen. All right. I have to bring this to my editor as soon as possible so we can put this in my newspaper. All right, Martin, thank you so much for that performance. I'm going to introduce our historical expert, Fong He. She recently received her, received her PhD in history from UC Santa Barbara. She specializes in transnational histories of gender, Chinese America, and American immigration. Her research centers on the roles of visuality and the racialized body to better understand American inclusion, exclusion, as well as empire building. Fong is turning her dissertation into a book uh, entitled Golden Lilies Across the Pacific, Bodies, Empire, and Paradoxes of Inclusion in the U.S. Enforcement of Chinese Exclusion Laws. I said that in one breath. <laughs> wow. She's also published a chapter from her book already, uh, Golden Lilies, in the Gendering the Trans-Pacific World um, periodical. She taught the course Chinese Americans at UC Santa Barbara, uh, and she's been accepted, very exciting news, uh, as a postdoc fellowship in, at New York University's Shanghai campus, where she will be affiliated with their Global, global Perspectives and Society program. So quite an accomplishment. And let me introduce uh, Martin, and then we'll welcome them both. Martin Wong is a junior 
and Bachelor of Fine Arts uh, acting program here at UC Santa Barbara. He's done a number of main stage plays on campus. Currently, he's, uh, he's part of the cast of the main stage play that's uh, in season right now. It's going to start in a few weeks called Into the Beautiful North. Highly recommend everyone in this audience check it out. I've become a fan of UC theater, and it's really high quality. You saw some demonstration of it here tonight. Very, very um, worthwhile for you to check it out. Besides acting, Martin is also a filmmaker, a director, and a producer. His latest short film is called Suppresses. 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 It's just been selected by the, um, for the Real Loud Film Festival. Very much like um, In Pu Chu, Martin has immigrated from China at the age of 14. And he's, was, he told me he was extremely humbled by this opportunity and very excited to bring Mr. Chu to light. And you did a great job with it. Let's Thank welcome you. them both. So very moving, very well done. Um, I, I kind of wanted to start with, I think many Americans have, and I think rightfully so, somewhat of a romanticized and idealized view of Ellis Island. You know, we know the Statue of Liberty, and we're all very proud of what that stands for. But a lot of us have, uh, our, our understanding of Angel Island is a little more clouded um, and for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, I'd love for you to just tell us a little bit about how you see some of those differences what the Chinese Americans you know, really did experience uh, and why you know, In was so um, adamant on making that his life mission to make a change there. Um, so I think uh, the history, uh, the perception of the U.S. of the country uh, that welcome uh, immigration, that's definitely a part of U.S. history, but uh, we tend to look back uh, the past through rose-colored uh, rose lens. Always, yep. That's why we kind of exaggerate that past because right. that doesn't represent the entire story. Uh, that's why there's uh, uh, the past of Andrew Island, which we, we don't want to publicize. That's what at least what happened in the past. Uh, but I think uh, when we are looking for a solution to like the current issues going on in the United States, we, we need to put aside the politics and focus right. on what actually happened in the past. Because if we don't, don't really know the truth, how can we find the right, right solution? Right. Um, and I think the uh, biggest difference is uh, the uh, like Ellis Island uh, was uh, created to process and facilitate immigrants mostly from uh, Europe across the Atlantic Ocean. Right. Uh, but that's more like the immigration regulation. Uh, but for the Andrew Island, it was established to enforce the Chinese exclusion laws. Uh, yes, there are immigrants from other countries uh, like Australia, uh, right. New Zealand, right. uh, Russia, Even Japan, Japan yeah. and other Asian yeah. countries. Uh, but the uh, primary reason for people to establish Andrew Island Immigration Station w uh, was to enforce the Chinese exclusion law. Do we know the, and, I'm, and just to be clear, Fong's uh, an expert, but it's, her dissertation wasn't on Angel Island. So <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot about that deep history. Um, but you're obviously very familiar with it. Do we know that like, the Japanese, for instance, were treated differently? I did read one thing that said that Japanese, um, uh, you know, everything's generalized, but in general, the Japanese immigrants were passed through much more quickly than the Chinese immigrants. Yes. So um, the thing is, even though Japanese also, uh, 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 I mean, Japan was also an Asian country, but uh, when we look at the issue of immigration, we need to consider the international relations between those countries. Right, right. Uh, I mean, between the, this country with uh, un the United States, and also that country's international standing back then. Um, the, the, so the cases first uh, uh, in 1882, there, there's Chinese Exclusion Act, which was passed. And then later, there's a gentleman agreement between U.S. and Japan mm. in 1907, but please notice the difference. One is Chinese Exclusion Act, and the other is just gentlemen's agreement. Mm -hmm. 
the reason why it was a, a, a agreement instead of exclusion, uh, that's because Japan uh, first uh, um, uh, like defeated China in 1895, like Sino-Japanese War, right. and also it defeated uh, Russia in 1905. So it was a rising power in the Pacific mm -hmm. uh, when the U.S. want to do similar thing to the Japanese. The Japanese uh, government kind of negotiated with the U.S. government uh, to say, okay, we agree to stop issuing passport on our part, like, you know, from Japanese uh, government so that, uh, you know, you don't have to uh, exclude us. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, and also U.S. Uh, uh, was willing to um, at least show a little bit more respect to Japan, considering its power back right, then. Right. So there was a rising power. Yeah. Uh, just, I mean, I, I'm not an expert by any means on, on much of anything, let alone this, but I did read something that surprised me that Ellis Island, about you know, the procedures weren't, I mean, a lot of people were detained in Ellis Island. It wasn't a, a joyride for everyone, but in general, the typical procedure was fairly perfunctory. They would ask you, you know, they would see if you were healthy. They would ask you, yeah. how much money do you have? Where, you know, where are you going? Do you have a relative? 2% of the people on Ellis Island were rejected and sent back home. And we know that the percentage um, at Angel Island was much higher. I wasn't able to find that percentage, but I think we know anecdotally it was much higher. Um, it, it's just interesting how, you know, I really like what you said because we, we are dealing with a similar issue today, immigration issue, and it's, it's amazing that 100 plus years later, we haven't really gotten much better at it. You know, we, and I think it's important to look at Angel Island, it's important to look at Ellis Island, what worked, what didn't work in both those, and learn from them. And let's, you know, let's grow as a country. And certainly not, not, not try to hide a piece of history that um, maybe we're not as proud of. You know, I, know, I read another anecdote, which is ironic, and I felt horrible for these people. There were some Chinese that had immigrated to Mexico. And you know they were having a, a, a nice life in Mexico. I think they were in uh, Sonora and uh, Sinolia, mm -hmm. and they got kicked out of Mexico. So they ended up having to come to Angel Island mm -hmm. and really have to immigrate twice. So what we have to remember as a as a as a, as a country is it's very it's very much a domino effect. Like what one country decides to do with Japan not issuing passports, it has a it has an impact that's multinational, even if it may not appear to be on the surface. Mm -hmm. We need to think about how the U.S. imperial power back then uh, played out uh, along U.S. Canadian border and also mm. U.S. Mexico border back then, and in terms of how uh, Mexico treated the Chinese immigrant, uh, Chinese immigrants, there was a process because at first uh, uh, it was. Uh, Chinese immigrants were welcomed in Mexico at mm -hmm. first uh, because they need neighbor. Uh, that's like in the late 19th century, but there was like a lot of uh, domestic, domestic changes in Mexico, you know, political climate, yeah. and also yeah. U.S. pressure <laughs> to collaborate, uh, collaborate the, uh, with the Mexican uh, government to enforce the Chinese exclusion law. So all, right. a combination of right. a lot of things. It's, it's not just one country's policy, it impacts. Mm -hmm. it, it but definitely U.S. Uh, pressures both oh, yeah, yeah. government Well, we were a rising to, power, right? Yeah. So we were starting to flex our muscles internationally and, and get our way. Yeah. Well, Martin, I want to ask you, um, what, what you, I did a great job. Your research was, was impeccable. Your presence was amazing. Um, it, nobody watching this is going to know you're a student if they just watch that performance. It was very, very well done. What drew you to in, like what, when you were reading about him, mm -hmm. um, what did you draw out of that character to deliver that performance? Well, I mean, first of all, I think it's just for, because, you know, I, I went to high school here and I took AP U.S. history, you know, AP world history, everything, but um, I think just in general, uh, minorities, historical figures are are never really talked about, right? You know, it's it's usually well. There's Booker T. Washington. I mean, it's like the same three yeah, people, right? Exactly. So so so, just, you know, just alone that fact that um, it you know he is someone that 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 is really significant in his field, and he's done a lot. But mm -hmm. but I never heard of him right. before before um, before this, right? You know, um, and even if you Google him, I'm sure. We all could. We go to Wikipedia. I mean, there's there's not really a lot that talks about him. You know, just like 
this much. You know. And one of the reasons why, and, and just to be clear to everyone, Fong is the person who brought this historical character to me. I didn't discover him, so I didn't know about him either. And one thing I really liked and, and, and was really pleased that to bring him in front of the students and in front of everyone watching, he was a very early sort of societal, social entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. He brought together, he, he was obviously a great orator or order. He was, mm -hmm. you know, recognizing his own day for that. Mm -hmm. um, he was a minister, so clearly most good ministers or effective ministers are good at oration. That's right. um, and he was able to combine a business, his newspaper, into a very successful business while still supporting his social movement or, or, or social commentary, which he found important. Now, I know his, his, his newspaper wasn't a propaganda newspaper for Chinese American rights. It, wasn't, it was a regular newspaper. There was advertisements. Mm -hmm. you know, he was making money. It was a business. Yeah. But he was able to use the editorial foundation of that newspaper for mm -hmm. things like his report that might not have seen the light of day. And I just didn't admire that in, in an entrepreneur when they could take you know, whatever resources are available to them, whether they're limited or not, and, and get their word out there. So yeah. all of you, you have an unbelievable amount of resources to tell the world what you think is important. You know, start blogging on Medium. Like, you could just make videos. You could, he didn't have yeah. any of that. He had to start his own newspaper. It's, it's funny because when we were reading the archival newspaper from the Chunsan Yapol, and um, usually half of, like, you know, there are six pages. Yeah. Half of each page were all advertisements. Like packed with advertisements. Like yep. if you think it's bad when you scroll through websites, <laughs> seeing all the ads pop up, for him it's half of it, pure ads. Yeah. Because that's how he kept the newspaper. But it was going. a targeted market. Like yeah. if you wanted yeah. to speak to you know Chinese Americans that cared about what was happening, mm -hmm. like that would be a great place to advertise. Yeah. And it's all within the community as well. You know, like the sure. laundromat, like like you know just all kind of totally. services Medicine. that's within exactly medicines, all kind of stuff that that within the community they need. As so well. like any entrepreneur, yeah. he found a need. Yeah. And he serviced it, but he also had that overlay of uh, working for writing what he felt like was a societal wrong. And I think history mm -hmm. looks back and would agree with them that it clearly was a societal wrong. Yeah. Uh, Fung, I want to talk a little bit about a little bit um, closer to your area of expertise. Um, with I know you you you've looked a lot at foot uh, women's fashion, footwear, how the binding um, cultural uh, beliefs and practices have impacted our, our footwear all of the Western world. I want to hear that, but I, but I also want to tie in um, what N was doing there, because he was explaining to the customs officials, just because a woman appears to have bound feet doesn't mean fill in the blank. They had this, I'll let you say it, but they had a certain preconception of what it meant. It was wrong. Yes, yeah, so the, the uh, 1911 investigation, uh, uh, Martin was uh, talking about in the performance uh, it's, uh, but what he didn't focus on uh, was when those uh, those committee members uh, witnessed an uh, investigation going on. They found out uh, the immigrants were asked a question like, uh, "What's your? Oh, were your mother's foot were bound?" Uh, so one of the com committee members said, "What a harsh treatment." Uh, uh, women's foot size has nothing to do with this, you know, right, right. Uh, admissibility, all the things. Uh, but the logic behind this question is, um, at least, uh, you know, I want to say there's two, re at least two reasons. One, one reason is uh, the, the U.S. want to include, admit women of respect, uh, respectability and also from higher class. Mm -hmm. So the perception was if, uh, if you're a Chinese woman with bound foot, that means you're from a better class background and you're women of better morals. But, uh, but the thing, the fact uh, in, in China is, so things everyone know, you know, I can gain something, I can gain a better uh, marriage prospect, I, I, I will be considered as a Chinese beauty. Right. So it was practiced across all the social classes. And that's where the immigration <laughs> get the facts wrong. But, they, uh, but th this has already been uh, in in institutionalized in the, in the practice. Right. Well, that's, it's an example of when cultural ignorance really has an extremely negative effect. Yeah. They were thinking they were doing you know, something positive by saying, oh, well, this is, this is a certain class of women. But, they, but 
Inn had to tell them, no, it's not a sign of, of, of class distinction. It's across all classes. Yeah, that, uh, that also reflects um, the ideal American uh, like body beauty standard back then because what I discovered in my research is um, uh, American women, some European women, they also had this small foot fever, especially if you think about this age old Cinderella story. Right, right. And, they, and you know, there's a, when, I, when I searched historical newspaper by keyword small foot, I was only expecting something about Chinese women in the United States, but there's a, a lot of newspaper uh, popping out out uh, about you know how there's like a, a photo of a, a French women who won small foot smallest right. foot right. Uh, competition in France, and also there's a lot of advertisement about uh, Chicago uh, small foot contests. <laughs> So I think, you know, the thing is if you give too much but, attention but to, to the otherness of, right, you know, right. Chinese culture, you right. forgot there's actually overlappings in terms of uh, gender uh, ideology and beauty standards. Yep. Um, and we see it even today, right, with some of these high-end shoes yeah. where they come to a point, I don't know how you get your feet <laughs> in them, right, um, and the high heels, super high heels, and yeah. really trying to accentuate that smallness of the foot. So it's, mm -hmm. it's something that's kind of stayed with us for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, but the one thing I want to add about why they ask about women's foot size, there's another more pragmatic uh, reason, because they will investigate the case uh, by asking, by cross-examining different people, like mm. the applicant and uh, some people who, who claim to know them, then they ask each person about, do you know like his wife, or his mother's uh, foot size, or his neighbors? Oh, wow. And then, you know, they cross-examine them to compare their testimony to say, oh, do, they, uh, do, they, uh, do their testimonies match with each other or not? So sometimes they even don't care about, uh, you know, whether your mother have that mm. or not. It's more about do you have discrepancies between the testimonies. Right. And part of that was from the 1906 fire. It destroyed records. Well, let me say that was their justification for much of it. it, may, it maybe it did start with that, and, but it was obviously taken to an extreme. But because of the big earthquake and then the resulting fire, a lot, records of all immigrant groups were lost. But that was then used to to justify the long, elongated interrogations. Whereas again, on the East Coast, it was like, yeah, my uncle's yeah. Irish, come on in, <laughs> whatever, right? Yeah. They weren't asking about any weird Irish um, cultural things that were different from America. I'm gonna go to the first student's question in one second. Um, but Martin, I just have another question for you. So when you're talking to your friends and you're explaining this, what you were involved in, what do you say to them about N that, that you, you want to convey to a wider audience? But when you're telling your friends about why N is important and why you wanted to, to put so much time into this character? Well, I think personally, big part is I feel very, I, I, feel, I feel in a way really related to, to his experience, mm. you know? Like, I came here when I was 14. He came here when he was 14. Right. You know? I mean, it's, it's very different times, obviously. Um, but, but just everything that he went through, you know, the just his up grip, upbringing, um, and he was one of the only um, Chinese that were like well known back mm -hmm. then. Right. You know, and that that's a huge deal, yeah. especially how people because we're doing research and it turned out that you know back then there were like what two thirds of the laundromats were run by yeah. Chinese people. Right. So right. so and before that, railroad workers and gold miners. You know, yeah. and yeah. they literally banned them right after they were done with the transcontinental railroad. A few years after that. Mm -hmm. Right. So so it's it's. I'm sure it's, that was coincidence. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but but you know so yeah. so for him to 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 have his own reputation, being who he is, you know, it's 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 a huge deal. Yeah. And I really admire that. I really in in a way, you know, because I pursue acting, I pursue things within the creative arts, you know, I, that's, that's what I want too, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And, I, and I'm, sh I'm sure that I'll, I have a much easier time doing that than, no. than yeah, him yeah. back then. Yeah, for know? sure. But yeah, and the what. roles were obviously very conscribed back then and yeah. were finely seen some yeah. of that. Yeah. Well, that's good. I think, I think those are, uh, that's a well-founded reason for, mm -hmm. for um, wanting to share his story. Um, you mentioned the laundry match, and I found it interesting that um, there's an entrepreneur that at some point I maybe like to get on stage, Wa Li, so he is credited with the first Chinese laundromat. And, and the reason, you know, he, he crushed it, right? He ended up having um, 
uh, three shifts, working, you know, 20 workers, working a lot. And, and what I read about is success, it, it's many of the same principles for um, immigrants of today. So you didn't really need to have a strong grasp of the language. Yeah. It was hard work. I mean, it wasn't fun work. And it was work other people didn't want to do. And the price is yeah. plummeted. So it cost $8 for a dozen shirts when he first started um, his business. It dropped down to um, $1.20, so almost oh. 8x. And it was because of that mm -hmm. extra productivity and that hard work. And what happened is more and more people started getting their clothes. I mean, it's hard to think about it. People didn't wash their clothes much mm -hmm. back then. It opened up that whole um, consumerism where people started thinking about cleanliness. Uh, you know, and as you said, two thirds of the laundromats were run by Chinese. They changed the law in San Francisco, and they said you can't have a laundromat unless it's in a brick building. Well, why did they do that? Right? They were trying to combat yeah. the success of the Chinese in that market, and they gave certain exceptions to non-Chinese laundromats that weren't in a brick building. Yeah. So, it, wow. using the government again to get at what the politicians of the day want, even if it's wrong. We'll take the first student's question. Hi there, my name is Lupe, um, and this is directed to both of you guys. In your opinion and your experience, what would you say is the biggest factor that impedes Chinese international students from building friendships with American students? Do you agree with Wu's encouragement to adapt to North American values as seen in his newspaper? Good question. Uh, I mean, so first thing is, you know, when we, when, we, when we are talking about the U.S. culture, like U.S. value and Chinese value, but do we have a clear definition for those things? Uh, you know, we also get used to those binary construct, uh, construction of right. uh, West versus East. But when you take a moment, <laughs> definitely think about it. Like, you know, we, we look at those Chinese restaurants in the United States. I mean, look at those ethnic foods. Uh, you know, is that Chinese? Is that American? How people, you know, react to it? So, you know, what is the uh, uh, U.S. value and how different uh, that uh, is from uh, Chinese value? And uh, our world is uh, a dynamic uh, entity and both countries are also very dynamic and uh, uh, heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. So that's the question we need to raise uh, first. Uh, and also, uh, some of you, you, uh, you mentioned like the assimilation. You know, that's another thing. We never know what we are assimilating to. You know, everyone is is defining it, right? But it's it, there's no clear boundary of those things. Uh, but to answer the question about like Chinese international student, U.S. student, I think it takes two people to form a uh, friendship. So I think. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I think, you know, there's, there, there's so many, we're talking about so many individuals. You can generalize, you know, uh, or ch uh, Chinese international students as a, as a uh, homogeneous group and U.S. people have different personalities and different hobbies and different points of view over a lot of things. So I do have some Chinese person I know. I don't feel like I have a lot to you know, right. share with them uh, or felt resonate. But I do have some American friends, I, I feel like, wow, I can't believe, you know, I don't really feel that boundary. But some people I do, but so it's, I don't, I don't think we, we need to. I think we just give too much weight, too much attention to like the national identity. You know, that's, uh, as a historian, I really want to send this message to our students. You know, more than nation states, that's just occupied very short periods of human history. But migration, cross-cultural interaction, that existed uh, at, as the beginning of human history. So that's, that's my, my answer to that. Yeah, we're absolutely seeing that with the DNA research, right? Where <laughs> we thought it was much more s segmented. And it's it's yeah. like, no, actually, there's DNA going yeah. all over the place. Let's break, yeah. down the, break, break down those boundaries. Right. Right. We'll go ahead and take the next student question. Oh, oh hi, my name Angie. is Angie. Yes. <laughs> um, so this question is for Martin. Um, in today's age, where people have begun embracing their culture, would you still encourage assimilating to Western um, American values? I think you can't really help that, you know. Especially like I know even in China, you know, it's, um, people start assimilating to people always do. You know, Western culture is something, especially pop culture. You know, like there are a lot of 
I don't, know, I don't know if you guys know, like a lot of really uh, big Chinese rap groups are getting popular and famous, like here, you know, in the United States. Like one of them called Higher Brother from Sichuan, you know, like like it's it's it's, and you know, they, I guess in a sense they assimilated, they adopted a very big part of American culture, which is hip hop, you know, and it's they they have dreads, they have tattoos, they have everything, you know, they ad libs and all that stuff. It's 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 I, I think it's it's not a bad thing, but 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 I think I think it's it's. It's good to know our roots at the same time and still have a sense of you know what we're assimilating to you know but 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 it's I don't think it's that it's not a bad thing and I, I don't think that will decrease the value of being who we are based on our culture you know they both can coexist I think yeah yeah we were off camera kind of conjecturing on how much how much uh, blowback he might have gotten for his assimilation message. I mean, it's really hard for us to know historically, yeah. but I'm sure he got some. I mean, there's always haters, there's always people that aren't gonna agree with you. And since he was such a vocal presence, he must have had to deal with some of that. But, but the one like, context that I can share is, uh, China was never like fully colonized by any Western powers. Mm. So that make, make a, a big difference. Uh, between China, uh, China, like Chinese semi-colonial society back then, and those fully colonized, uh, especially like a African African countries, so they uh, they were co like th those colonizers were present, fully present mm -hmm. at many levels of their life. So, in those societies, it witnessed massive resistance. But in China, the thing is because they, they like they kind of semi experienced the, you know the power and of of the Western countries. But so the elites and the national uh, nationalists they want to reform China. They want mm. to make change. Mm -hmm. So that's why you actually pretty very, a lot of elites Chinese elites. Uh, very much embrace uh, the West, mm -hmm. uh, even though they don't like uh, take the whole package of whatever right. West uh, was doing. But they do want to uh, learn from like the especially they have debate, you know, like for um Chun, he wants you know uh, this uh, the Christianity to 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 save China from mm -hmm. its national crisis. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the face of Western encroachment and Japanese aggression, but for some people, they think we definitely need to learn the advan advanced technology from the West. We need to, like in China, need to build uh, the railroads, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. so and right. industry, all the things. So that's um, that's something uh, that's uh, something I want to share with uh, with the students. You know how to look at the assimilation. It's more. I, I mean, it's better phrased. Uh, uh, to be like learn from learn from the West uh, instead of uh, assimilation and becoming part of it. Yeah. But yeah, and I agree with what you said earlier about we look at we I say Western culture look at things in binary terms. We'd like to look at things in binary terms. It's easier, right? Yeah. But it's many things in life aren't. They're a spectrum, and they're, it's not one or the other. And it's and very assimilation's the same way, right? And it's yeah. very this kind of binary is, is very powerful because sometimes we don't want to use our heads. You know, it's use that. Yeah, yeah, it's either. And also, the power of those uh, the Western ideas or some kind of framework. <coughs> Uh, it's especially powerful, uh, has been very powerful in China. That's because China was defeated <laughs> in yeah. the, like the right. OPM <laughs> war. So, uh, but even after World War II. And that's the sad part of it because China always looked for the West for models. But if the West didn't focus on working on itself, we don't have a good alternative. That's why when the foot binding was abolished in China, high heels replace foot binding. And there's this uh, discussion in the United States and in China uh, compare you know, the, the shape of butt fit uh, to the, the shape of uh, high heels. And that people criticize it. It's, not, uh, it's det detrimental to women's house. But the you know the like the uh, sweeping power of this kind of Western modernity kind of really uh, you know get a stronghold uh, in in China and that's why we don't have a lot of alternative today right. because pe Chinese people were not, at least in China you know Ch Chinese people did not really very critically 
engage with whatever the West uh, has to offer. I think that's, I mean, I feel like I'm not obviously Chinese or more expert, but I feel like that's becoming, the parity's changing a little bit, so it's probably less, let's accept everything from the West. I, I feel that uh, from not just China, yeah. but other countries around the world. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a terrible thing. We'll take one more student question and then I have a final question. Uh, my question is for Fong. Uh, what sparked Chu's passion for defending Chinese American civil rights? Uh, could you repeat the question again? Yes. Sorry. Uh, what sparked Chu's passion for defending uh, Chinese American civil rights? Oh. So, um, first, uh, he was uh, a part of Chinese America. <laughs> so, his, his fate uh, closely tied to uh, you know, the, the Chinese American uh, civil rights. And, and um, I, th I think that's the uh, most obvious uh, reason why why not to do that for his own fellow fellows and also for him himself his families and also you know I think uh, he he has a lot of uh, good education and he observed uh, what was going on on both sides so he want to share uh, what he ob observed in China want to show that's the truth people need to know. The reason why we have had this kind of tension or injustice, it's not like everyone in the United States were not kind, right? Because he, he was affiliated with like church, you know, missionary group, so he knows there's so many kind people out there, you know, um, and helped him. So he, he said, he, he th I think he, he realized that it is very important to make sure people know as uh, what, uh, Martin show in his performance, you know, we want to show people uh, who we actually are. So that's one of the reasons. Yeah, the humanity, right? Yeah, yeah it's some, sometimes people don't actually see through the skin color or, you know, cultural very different uh, appearance. Right, yeah. right now the entire world is way more westernized. I didn't even know, oh, High heels is from West, <laughs> you know, growing right. up. Ah. Like, uh, until I, I study, I stu yeah, I take it for, for granted. Right. You, know, you just observe this every day. Right, right. So. Well, I have one final question I, I like to um, ask. It's an unfair question because it's unknowable, but I do like to ask it when we're talking about historical figures. If uh, In Pung Chu was born in 1995, let's say, what, I'll ask both of you, what, what do you think his career arc would have been? Yeah, he's younger than me, so well, probably. Well, if he was, <laughs> I could say if he was born when you were born. In other words, if he was a modern person, how, what do you think he would have ended up pursuing? Or He could still. Um, Acting. <laughs> well, maybe, so think about his skills, right? So he was a good writer. Yeah. He had um, that passion for bringing Chinese people into America, mm -hmm. so he probably, you know, that probably would have manifested itself in some form or fashion. And in this time period, we'll probably, that's not a bad thing. There's a lot of cross-cultural things happening in China right now. Um, I think his social activism would have been apparent. Yeah. So it feels like that stew would have been mixed in modern, in a modern sense. Mm -hmm. And with travel much easier now, maybe he would have gone back and forth more. Mm -hmm. Maybe he could have been sort of, some sort of an agent. Um, working with tech companies over there. I mean, who knows? But I, but I feel like he would have, he still would have leveraged those core <coughs> skills, and I think mm -hmm. he still would have, you know, he wasn't out to make a buck um, only. He really obviously wanted to uh, follow those Christian ideals and make the world a better place. Yeah. yeah, I have friends who uh, came to the United States and converted to Christianity just, uh, you know, recently. So, ah. you know, you know, there's, there's still parallels here, but I think uh, today, um, you know, if uh, Wu Peng Chu came to the, uh, come to the United States, he will have more um, uh, more op options. Uh, but definitely, I think his bi uh, bicultural bilingual skills can help him, no matter in the past or today to be a very successful person. Mm -hmm. And another message I want to uh, deliver to students is, you know, just to be global minded yep. and uh, try to learn more language, learn from uh, different cultures. And that's definitely uh, will uh, put you in a very competitive uh, spot. Yep. Stand up for what you believe in, find your voice, 
and try to find an audience for your voice, whether it's through blogging or videos, or in his day it was newspapers. So Fong and Martin, I really appreciate both of you taking so much time, putting so much energy into this. Really do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As you know, our sponsors are what make this happen. This, I wish this was all free, but it's not. Um, we do need to underwrite the cost associated with, with recording these broadcasts. Uh, and we have two sponsors, uh, co-sponsors tonight. We have Todd Crawford from Impact. He's going to tell you a little bit about Impact. Uh, and then Lauren's going to tell you about um, Tapjoy. Let's give Todd a hand. Thanks, John. So a quick show of hands. How many people here have ever heard of Impact or we were, it used to be Impact Radius? Do you know anybody that works there? This is probably useless because I can hardly see it with the lights shining in my eyes. Uh, how many people here know what affiliate marketing is? Not very many. John has not taught you this. Okay. So let me just give you an example. Let's say I'm an online bookseller and all of you are in book clubs or avid readers and you have your own blog and you blog about the books you read. And obviously if I were reading your blog, I would want to buy a book because I, I liked what you said about it. And so you could link to my store. And if you link to my store, the deal we have is I'll give you 10% of any sales you refer to me through the link for every book that you review. And so we need some kind of technology that will make that happen, right? So that you can sign up as an affiliate of my bookstore. You can log in and get a link to the book that you read. You can see reports on how many people clicked on them and how many sales you had and what your commission is. And then you're going to want to get paid. Uh, so we'll transfer the money into your bank account or PayPal it to you. So that's what affiliate marketing is. The team, uh, I'm one of the founders. My name is Todd Crawford. I think you already know it. Uh, and we started Impact in 2008. But previous to that, we started Commission Junction, another company here in town, often called CJ. And we were really one of the first global affiliate networks. And an affiliate network has that tracking capability that I just described, but also they manage the programs. They help tell you which brands and which um, books maybe you should promote or tell you about a coupon or something. And so I've been in the industry since 1998. That's when we started uh, CJ. Uh, it was actually back in Minneapolis and then we relocated here because we, one of the other founders was a UCSB graduate student in, uh, in computer engineering. And so we sold that company to ValueClick in 2004 and then in 2008 we got the band back together again to do something different. And what's interesting when you go in to either start your own business or you join a company like Impact is kind of like, what are they doing? Are they competing against other companies for the same pie? So if we had, when we got together to start Impact, we did not want to start another affiliate network. We wanted to create something different. We wanted to actually grow the pie. And so to do that, you have to be dis a disruptor. And so you have to go in, and what you're doing is you're kind of counterattacking existing business models. And the affiliate network industry, which is multi-billion dollar industry just in the United States alone, from the amount of spend going through, the amount of commissions being paid out every year. So we wanted to go in and disrupt it. And so the things that we saw that we could do differently were to be a, a software as a service business. In other words, we would license our technology instead of charging a percent of the commissions that get paid out. So in my example where you paid, were paid 10%, as an advertiser, as that bookseller, I had to pay a network uh, 3% in addition. So my total commission was 13% and you got 10. We would license our technology so we weren't taking an override, so we came across as a little cheaper, but the thing that really set us apart is we really focused on technology and by delivering really great technology, far better data, far better controls, far better automation in managing this channel, we were able to track a lot of really great brands. Now we founded the company here in Santa Barbara. Today, uh, how many years later, 2019 from eight, anybody good at math, that's 11 years, okay. Uh, <clears throat> we have 400 employees globally and we have 11 offices. So Santa Barbara is our, our headquarters along with our New York office, but we have offices in San Francisco, Seattle, um, in New York, in London, in Oslo, in Cape Town, in Sydney, in Singapore, and in Shanghai, and also Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> so, and we're growing all the time. We're going to open two more this year. So uh, it's pretty exciting um, when you think about 
uh, starting with a company that has such a big global footprint. We work with a lot of great brands like Target, Kohl's, Uber, Airbnb, Lenovo. Uh, so there's a lot of brands, really large enterprise brands, but also small and startup type brands. And what sets us apart as a company is we've really focused on building a technology solution. So what we're doing is we're changing the game. We're doing more than affiliate marketing. We call it partnership marketing. And we're taking all of our technology and we're kind of repackaging it into something we're calling the partnership cloud. And it's really resonating with brands. They're creating more kinds of partnerships than just the affiliate. So in affiliate marketing, if you were a retailer, you would think of it as a bunch of sites that are typically coupon sites. So if you've ever been to Retail Me Not or, or coupons.com to look for coupons online, those are tracked through affiliate links. Or if you sign up with a company like Ebates or maybe through one of your banks or credit cards, you get points back. Those are all tracked through affiliate links. It's a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. And so what we really thought would be very powerful is to build more technology outside of the affiliate marketing space that helps enhance these types of partnerships. And that's what we've been doing. And uh, you know, if you're thinking of how many people here are graduating this year? It's pretty hard to sit through this class, I bet. It's getting close. How many of those people already know what you're going to go do? Yeah, that's the hard part. Um, well, I mean, obviously there's lots of great local companies here in Santa Barbara, and it's a great place to get your start. We've had a lot of our employees move to other offices after they've kind of got their, you know, the job that they're doing, uh, you know, figured out at Impact. So we've had a uh, UCSB graduate move from here to our Sydney office and is doing really well there, heading up a team. Uh, we've had people from our New York office move to Santa Barbara and vice versa, or to our London office or from our... Cape Town office to Santa Barbara. So there's a lot of opportunity. And just to give you a sense of, I'm just checking my time here, I don't want to go over. I promise I'd keep it under 15. Um, just to give you a sense of like some of the jobs that people are doing. We have a customer success team and they're really working with these large enterprise brands to help them understand how to leverage our technology to grow the channel for them. So that's a big piece of, uh, uh, and those are across almost all of our offices. We have obviously a sales team that's out there trying to get brands to buy our technology or consider it. We are uh, also dealing with um, marketing. So we have a big marketing team with big demand gen. So we're constantly trying to create awareness around our brand and get into the accounts that we really want to be our clients that aren't yet. Uh, we obviously have programmers and QA. We have finance. Um, we, have a, we have a learning and enablement team, and what they're doing is they're building out all these online training uh, courses that we put our new employees through, our existing employees, and now we're extending it to our agency partners and our uh, clients. So it's, it's really exciting, and we're seeing a lot of high growth, and that's helping employees that have started at the ground level to move up into other positions, and that's a big focus for us is to grow our team into new positions. And I can tell you, being in this industry for over 20 years now, there are executives that work for Macy's and lots of other companies that got their first job when we started, you know, Commission Junction back in 1998. So, you know, it can really change your life and give you an opportunity or at least an awesome experience and work with a great company. I mean, we do a lot of stuff for our employees. Uh, we really focus on great benefits. And we really want uh, it to feel like a family and a team that's really excited about getting things done and working with great brands. We host you know, lunch in the, every office on Friday and we do a big update so everybody understands kind of some of the new wins and some of the cool things that we've been doing around the globe to keep everybody up to date. It's dog friendly. Um, our office is really cool. If you've ever been invited over to one of our events, uh, uh, Fiesta or Cinco de Mayo. We always have, uh, seems like friends of friends coming over to those. But um, if you're looking to get into kind of this kind of digital space, this online technology that's really out there disrupting and changing the industry, uh, changing the world really, I mean, we're providing a lot of growth for other built businesses and that's really the exciting part. So not only are we employing a lot of people that are getting their start and furthering their career, but we're really helping grow the industry and that's where it gets exciting because you're really not just going in and kind of grinding for you know, another account that you stole from another competitor. You're, you're really working on, on growing the whole industry. 
So I don't think we're taking questions, but I will introduce you to a counterpart in the industry who will tell you a little bit more about the other side and how it works. <laughs> Hi guys, um, I'm Lauren. I am a former gaucho, Olay, graduated 2009. Um, with me, we have Erica, who is new to Tapjoy. So I'm just here to tell you guys a little bit about Tapjoy and what we're all about. Um, we, so basically, I guess I can't really see anyone either, but to kind of set the stage, uh, raise your hand if you guys play any games on your phone. Word game, yeah, okay, lots of people. Cool, so what Tapjoy does is we are a mobile advertising platform that allows advertisers to interact with um, consumers in the mobile gaming space. We uh, basically reward users for interacting and engaging with ads, and that can be anything from watching a video to downloading an app all the way to making a purchase. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much Tapjoy. We, uh, let's see, I'm like, where can I start? So um, we have an office in Santa Barbara. This is, our, our headquarters are in SF, but we have a sales office in Santa Barbara, and then we are global. Um, we have, I think, five offices in the United States, if I can count right. So we have offices in New York, LA, Chicago, um, San Francisco and Santa Barbara. And then we also have offices in um, Europe and Asia, so China, Japan, um, and London. And um, a few like satellite offices in, in the US, so we have some people in Austin and Tennessee. Um, we actually work with Impact, so what my role is at Tapjoy is to manage strategic partnerships. So what that means is, I work with strategic affiliate partners um, and manage those advertiser relationships that we get from um, people like Impact. And to Todd's point, um, starting in the affiliate industry is a really great uh, stepping stone. Both Erica and myself come from uh, one of their competitors and also someone that Todd helped um, found, but CJ. So we both come from that affiliate space and we manage affiliate relationships now. Um, at Tapjoy in the Santa Barbara office, it's a sales team. So we have uh, the strategic partnerships team, which focus primarily on affiliates and large direct relationships that we've had for a long time. Uh, we also have our performance sales team. So these are um, sales reps who are going after any um, direct advertisers and mobile game developers who are running user acquisition campaigns, and it's all on a performance basis. So um, basically, if a user is rewarded for engaging in an app, that's where we would actually charge the advertiser as well. Um, and we work with, so the types of companies we work with would be like, um, some big game developers would be like Machine Zone, um, who, I'm like, who else on the game side? Um, Play Studios and a few others. And then on the brand side, um, we work with big brands like Target through Impact. And then we also work with direct advertisers as well. So um, those would be like Dollar Shave Club, Hulu, um, Amazon, and so on and so forth. And I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting anything. But yeah, that's pretty much this office. Um, I'm like, I think that's it. I don't know, there's not, if you like mobile gaming and you like, uh, or you're looking to be in the mobile space, which is always changing, um, I think Tapjoy is a really good opportunity for you guys. And we're happy to you know, stick around and answer any questions um, while we can. But um, yeah, it's just a, it's been a really fun, um, close knit team. We're kind of like a family, there's about, 16 people in the office now, also dog friendly, um, which is I think a very big plus. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's, that's Tapjoy. Thank you. <laughs>